r slash no sleep drunk submitted by katyalina please understand this a voluntary furlough my boss said smiling along with the ceo and the human resources manager staggering to get my words out i made a note to clarify voluntary furlough to prevent the act of being laid off yes correct i quickly calculated my odds furlough yes at least i'd be promised a job when all the coronavirus was behind us laid off well who knows where i'd end up i guess i'll take it without much choice it seems great sign right here that had been two weeks ago i wish i'd never said yes just took my chances at being the one being laid off at least there was a slimmer of a chance that maybe it wouldn't have been me or maybe i would have packed up my bags and headed to my dad's place down in lewisburg it's all too late now the day of the news i went home and let jerry my husband know in a sense he was excited for me hey you can draw unemployment rest easy for a while take the much needed vacation you deserve spend more time with taylor bug at this note he reached over and gave taylor a small pat on the head our precious six month old to top it off i felt like i should have been happy about it but there was fear even in the beginning much later that evening he got a call on his cell it wasn't abnormal for him to get calls late at night considering he was a traveling nurse and all i just later wished he had never answered it's vanderbilt he said as he entered the bedroom ending the call they're down nurses something terrible it was a statement not a question of whether or not i was fine with him going just a statement i see how long at least a few weeks a month tops he started to grab his duffel bag and throw scrubs into it from the closet when i didn't respond it must have been a cue for him to finally turn and look me in the face you know this is only temporary another six months of the traveling gig and we will be able to pay off the second car we are so close marie he was right it had even been my idea in the beginning as soon as he passed his licensure i encouraged him to apply to a traveling nurse circuit the money was more than he could ever make around here and again it wasn't meant to be forever just until we could get caught up he left the next morning with me never apologizing for being rude about the situation the first few days were okay taylor was on her best behavior and i really could not have asked for a better company but i grew bored quickly before now i had always been too busy to watch tv i never figured out how jerry had rigged it so i couldn't even figure out how to get it off the black screen after i pushed power to watch anything i had done a deep spring cleaning earlier in the year so there were no puzzles to keep me wound up i did find an old can of paint and decided to paint the living room a fresh baby blue but that only kept me occupied for a few days being the last house on a mile stretch of dead-end road made it to where the only person i saw was taylor at least that was until i found the tomato box i had run out to the garage looking for a hammer there was a loose nail on the front porch i decided to finally take care of myself after many months of asking jerry to do it i didn't turn the light on because i knew where the hammer was exactly at but as i maneuvered through all the junk to get to it i felt a thud against my toes fuck i whispered as taylor was asleep I went and turned the lights back on to see what I had rammed my toes into. Under the workbench was a cardboard box. Printed in a cursive font said Georgia Tomatoes. I'd never thought of Georgia being known for its tomatoes. Whatever was in, there felt heavy. I carefully pulled off the lid, avoiding spider webs best I could, and revealed its contents. There sat 12 mason jars filled with a mysterious peach-colored liquid. I picked up a jar to examine it and saw a little cherry inside, still on the stem. Sudden recollection hit me. The last time Jerry's cousin Ralph had been in town from Georgia, he brought some of his home-brewed wine. I giggled. Of course, Jerry would hide wine from his alcoholic wife. There was also a thought of resentment, if he had just fixed the nail on the front porch, I would never have found it. I'd found AA two years ago, and it couldn't have come at a better time. I was close to losing my job, losing my marriage, and losing my mind. It had been a godsend. I found a sponsor worked the steps and kept the 24-hour chip in my pocket at all times to remind it is merely a one day at a time program but the thing about pandemics is when they close things down you lose connection churches had been closed down since march which was primarily where meetings are held i know what you're probably thinking aren't there meetings online couldn't you have called your sponsor sure but living out in the country makes these things difficult our internet provider some off-brand company made facetiming harder than finding waldo 
and it had been so long since I talked to my sponsor due to my shame of not attending any kind of meetings well. I just didn't. Maybe I'm projecting, maybe I'm trying to find the bad guy in all this and just don't want it to be me. Using my inner wisdom gathered from being in a program meant for people wired the way I am, I told myself to just take it easy, take it one day at a time, one hour at a time if I had to. I would swear with my right hand on top of the Alcoholics Anonymous text that if it hadn't been for not being to a meeting in two months, I would have never ended up taking a drink of that wine. But that just wasn't in the cards for me. Later that evening, I realized I hadn't heard from Jerry. Taylor was already in bed, and he always called to hear her babble into the phone before I tucked her in. Inherently, I also thought while I was finding my phone, I may as well break down and call my sponsor. All afternoon, everything had started to turn bleak. My thoughts blended into being curious about what that cherry in the bottom of the jar tasted like. I could almost smell it and if I could, it would have smelled like home. But the problem was, I couldn't remember the last time I had seen my phone. I couldn't find it. Thinking how it could almost be dead and having no way to dial it or ask someone to dial it for me, I felt forlorn. What was I going to do? If you can't find your phone, it's a signal from God to help yourself to the box. I stopped at that thought halfway through checking the couch cushions. No, that's not how God works. Maybe not, but maybe you're better now. That thought meddled in my brain a bit longer. You have an excuse to not stay drunk all the time, you've got Taylor. One little sip wouldn't hurt, and you could call it a lapse, wouldn't even have to reset your two-year timer. And with that, I found myself in the garage. I don't even recall walking out of the living room, through the kitchen, and opening the garage door. Just there I was standing in front of the box with the lid still off from earlier. I felt thirsty, parched, in fact. I knelt down and grabbed a jar, my hands shaking so much I fumbled with the lid all the way until I screwed it off. The smell hit me in the face hard enough. I jerked my head to the point it put a strain on my neck. It smelled like... home. Yes, home. That first sip tasted like home too. This is all I remember of May 8, 2020. I woke up the next morning feeling as if I had been drained of all life. It took me a moment to gather my surroundings, I didn't feel as if I were in my bed. I jerked my eyes wide open to realize I was staring at the ceiling in the living room. Ah, the couch it had been. The sickening knot in my stomach felt so familiar, after all, it had only been two years. My vision felt doubled, at times, even tripled, as I made my way to Taylor's bedroom. She was crying, no, screaming, at the top of her lungs. Good God, what time is it? Keeping one eye closed, I tried to concentrate on the hands of my watch. 2.30 PM. Grabbing Taylor and making sure she was okay, but still, the incessant screams would not stop, I hurried to the garage and flipped on the lights. It was only a sip, I swear, I only took a sip. Two mason jars were empty cherry and all. How am I going to explain this to Jerry? I sat down on the concrete floor, holding Taylor to my chest as tight as I could. I began to sob. What had I done? That's when the garage door slammed, that was when I realized I wasn't alone in the house. After hours of searching, still not able to find anyone, still not able to find my phone, I began to feel the paranoia shake off. It was just in your head. The head that was throbbing, to say the least. I went to the fridge to grab a bottle of water, and as I opened the door, the shiny metal caught a glimpse of a long-haired woman. I quickly wheeled around. Nothing. No one was there, but I had seen her there. With a haste about me, I grabbed up the now clean tailor, went to the front foyer for my keys and... They were gone. I wrenched open the drawer on the table and found my extra key fob, and buried myself into the drifty night. I pressed the unlock button, but there were no lights from the driveway. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, by the moonlight I could tell, my car was gone. Back in the house, I searched again, carrying a baseball bat with me for the woman, yes it was most certainly a woman. But after opening every closet and checking under, around, and above every nick and cranny, no one could be found. Taylor wasn't helping matters, she wouldn't quit screaming. So inconsolable from my neglect earlier that day, there was nothing I could do to make up for it. My own self ailments felt like they were getting worse. I was hanging on by a thread. All I knew is I wanted out of the house, because even though I couldn't see the woman, I could feel her. I went to find the laptop, I was going to find a way to email the police or maybe download an app to be able to text off of, I think you can text 911, right? But alas, 
There was no laptop where the laptop was supposed to be. Jerry took it on his trip. That's when I heard it, in my head I also felt like I saw it out of the corner of my eye, the woman running towards the garage. I grabbed the bat, which I hadn't kept out of my sight, and ran after her, she's going to pay for stealing my car and breaking and entering. But when I got to the garage, no one was there. And here I was again, faced with the bootlegger wine sitting in the middle of the room. The dull thump in my brain began to slow, even Taylor's screams seemed far away, as I stared at the box. There was a jar sitting outside the box with the lid screwed off. It was as if it was waiting for me. This is all I remember of May 9, 2020. I woke up the next day, barely able to move. My vision was even more distorted than the day before. What is wrong with me? But at least it was silent. This time I awoke on the garage floor, laying where Jerry's car normally was. Then it clicked. Jerry. Surely he'll notice I haven't answered the phone and he'll call someone to check on me. But. What if he's too busy? What if he's working 16 hours shifts? What if he doesn't want to call you because of how you acted before he left? What if he never calls, and you're just here? Alone, alone with. I heard a tapping on the window. There stood the woman, with graying skin. One arm was bent in a direction that seemed abnormal though, and then I noticed it. She had a bone breaking through the skin, oh god how sick she looked and then. I threw up as I realized she was holding Taylor. I pushed the button to open the garage, but quick enough, the deranged woman was running away with Taylor through the woods behind our house. I felt like I was losing my mind. I could chase after her on my own, or run to the nearest house about a mile away. Have them call for help. But what if we lose her trail? I stepped out into the bright light of the new day, not knowing which way to run. But then, blessed be, that's when the blue lights started to come from over the top of the hill. Help was finally here. Now here I am, sitting at the dining room table explaining to the officer for the fifth time what had happened over the past few days, leaving out the alcohol part of course. They can smell it on you. Officer Bridges turned to his partner, they stared at each other for a moment and turned back to me. Ma'am, we found your car. I grab at my throat, thank God, but I don't understand why you're not with the other police looking for my baby. You have been here for four hours, just asking the same ridiculous questions. It was in a ditch, Officer Bridges continued, ignoring my cries. Do you remember driving it in the past few days? I was taken aback. I haven't driven it since I was furloughed. No reason to really, I mean I just went grocery shopping last week. Officer Bridges grabbed a photo out of his right shirt pocket. We actually came out here looking for a missing woman, last seen running through the neighborhood a few nights ago. Does this woman look familiar to you? The woman with the abnormal arm, the woman who had stolen my baby. Yes that's her. She's the one that. No, he laid the photography on the table. That can't be, see she's been dead for the past 36 hours. She was ran over about a quarter mile down the road. By your car. It crashed in all at once. I looked over his shoulder and saw the same woman in the picture standing outside the window, holding my blue-faced baby.